Hi to my community friends and hello to our listeners in Bangkok in Thailand. You are amongst this month's top city for episode downloads. I'm back with another bonus episode of the Smart Community Podcast, sharing various guest answers to the question, where to next for smart cities and communities? And this time, I'm sharing with you the answers from these guests. Emily Bobbers from episode 291, Dan Hendry from episode 292, Beata Kubitz from episode 293, Michael Milford from 294, and finally, Chrissy Dittmore from 296. Some themes that come through in the guest answers are around the shift in growth to suburban living, connectivity, data literacy, education, and learning from each other. Every smart community has some great things to offer, so sharing these ideas, knowledge, and solutions is so important. And not only learning from each other, but learning from the past and past mistakes should just be part of the process. As Dan Hendry says, learning from each other, that's the smartest thing we can ever do. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Well, where to next for smart communities? Gosh, I think it's really about data but and data education, data literacy. So, like, everyone talks about how amazing big data is, but we kind of need to make sure that people can apply it properly. Uh, in one of my podcast episodes, <laughs> shameless plug, I was talking to a guy called David Brown. He was saying that big data can be one kilometre wide but one millimetre thick. And I think that that's such an important distinction is we need to make sure that the data we are bringing in that, first of all, people understand that it exists, people understand how to use it, but people understand how to use it in a way that's actually constructive and we don't end up getting those data biases. So the uh, common example is the planes coming back from World War II where there were, these are all the bullet holes, we need to make sure we cover the planes where they've been shot. And then someone pointed out, well, these are actually the the planes that came back. So we need to cover the places where they weren't shot because it was the, I think, survivor bias or whatever that one was called. So making sure that people have the literacy to actually extract the value of what you're trying to give them. So definitely data and data education and literacy is a huge thing. Yeah, I agree. And I guess roll into that. It's like the ethics component, like just because we can, should we? We need more people that have uh, that are thinking that way to be able to ask those questions and decide the input into decision making in that space. And I think there's so many examples of it's like, oh, it must be this because the data said this. And then there's like some rando like reason why women couldn't input because it was whatever, whatever the day was or whatever. Like, you know, it, things like that. And when you hear about it, you're like, well, that's obvious. But if you don't have people that have those experiences inputting in a real way into the, the algorithms and the or even reviewing the results and going, hang on, this you can't publish this. This is weird then you end up with these things um, out in the public sphere and, and hopefully we'll see more and more in the positive way where it will be like, oh, we were, this is the way it was going, but then this happened. So now we're going to shift and change and make it better for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I also think sometimes it's the data you don't have that's just as important as the data that you do. <laughs> so good. I wish I didn't make a noise while you were saying that because that sort of has to be an audiogram and then they're going to have to cut it out and it's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> So where to next for smart communities? Well, hopefully any listener, if you're listening to this podcast, please look me up if you want to talk to me. You know, I'm sure my information will be there. There's a TEDx to watch. I have resources. But I, for me and this smart community, I want to scale youth transit programs to change communities. That's my thing. I can't be good at everything, but I can be good at one thing. And it might not be archaeology, but it seems to be youth transit and buses. <laughs> and so if anyone hears this, for me, that's what I think. But I also look at like, learning from each other. That's the smartest thing we can do. This is something we did well, but there's some cool food initiatives or tech initiatives or other mobility initiatives talking about how mobility integrates too, right? With that last mile of getting from the bus or transit system to home, the way we built out our communities in a lot of ways, right? So I think the next step is 
is pausing a little. Uh, it doesn't seem we don't have too much time with some of the stuff, but to learn from each other and and rapidly scale and integrate and alter things that make sense for the communities and the demographics and the geography in which we live, you know? So really it's about, I think in a lot of ways, about learning from each other and, and trying to learn from the best because we're all the best. We have a lot of good things in every community and, and we can just keep on making them better, you know? Mm, yeah, I agree. I think learning from each other and learning from our mistakes and not even mistakes, like just learning from the way that we did things and we test, yeah. we tried this, we did that is really, really important. So then we can actually action those things as well. I had a great conversation with someone earlier this week around committing to actually then doing the thing after you've gained all the information. So we're not just talking, but then we're committing to take action with the information that we have. And I think that's really key because we need action, right? But we also need, I, I, I feel like, yeah, we obviously need action, but that can start with a conversation. And I think yeah. start with those ideas. So we shouldn't, I guess, undervalue that first interaction that you have that then yeah. leads to action too. Well, yeah. and it's still part of the process. I look at it like sometimes I think we undervalue because we want you know, the pyramids were built from what I read over, it took 25 years of human life, right? Just imagine that. And yet we want everything done in 15 seconds or less, right? So don't forget that it is a continuous process. And we are, all those actions we're taking are part of the action. Sometimes it feels like everything should and needs to be done. There's urgency to some of this stuff, but at the same time, don't undervalue or not appreciate the effort you're putting in because it's part of the process. It can create the domino that hits the bigger domino, right? And I never judge that walking away. I always just say, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen, but something's going to happen. Where to next for smart cities and communities? I think less is more. More smarts, more communities which are, don't have to go as far for all of their services. I think that's definitely a where to next. It's uh, the 15-minute, 20-minute city, the half an hour rural area. Those, I think, are important where to next. And then just putting that infrastructure in that enables people to travel safely and without increasing their carbon footprint. Having that there so that when we give them digital tools and or manage our services digitally and optimise them, there is the RIM infrastructure over to which to manage and run those services. Where to next for smart cities and communities? Oh, just as a general question, look, I don't know. I think one of the most exciting, as an outside observer who is not a deep technical expert, I think one of the most exciting trends is connectivity, as things like 5G and now 6G get talked about a lot more, and then the associated enabling technologies like blockchain, the potential of what you could do with that to assist or augment or enhance technologies like autonomous vehicles are connected to autonomous vehicles, but also a lot of other things is hugely exciting and something I'm trying to actively uh, learn more about. Although blockchain just does my head in. I just don't, I get, it's one of those concepts which I just struggle to navigate through. But those sort of technologies are really exciting. There's no major hardware barriers to their implementation, right, too. So there's a lot of ethical concerns and you need to have the right backends and all that sort of stuff. But there's no reason you couldn't have a much more connected city that is secured by some of these other technologies. And, and the sort of things that that would enable, you obviously see futurists talk up some of the scenarios, but I'm sure there's hundreds, if not thousands, of really valuable scenarios where those things can augment, aid, or make up for the shortcomings of some of these autonomous or robotic or AI technologies. And that's that's hugely exciting. So where to next for smart cities and communities? Well, I personally am headed after this to APTA's rail conference. I think there's going to be a lot of discussion around expansion of rail, especially in the North America market where it's so limited compared to other countries. And I'm looking forward to conversations that keep that moving forward. I think, I think honestly, a lot of places are just needing to double down on building better bus networks. The shift to growth in the suburbs and really our lack of housing regardless. So if you think about it, even if everybody decided to move back to the city, there's still not enough housing in this, in cities to house all of those people. So you actually have to have people living in the suburbs. And both of those places have to be supported with fast, reliable transit, which means what public transportation has done traditionally is serve downtown cores 
well. And now people are going to be staying living in those exteriors. And so really making the shift to how to best address both of those kinds of needs, because there's always the debate of what kind of service is better, a wide service that doesn't have fast headways or a narrow service area that has frequent headways. And it's really that conundrum of every city makes a different choice there. And you see success or failure. And I'll just, I guess, put a pin in arguing that failure is never really a thing, that it's just a process on the progress on your journey. But whether you're seen as being progressive, whether you're seen as doing the right things for your community is is all of the change that's really necessary right now. So that's kind of where I think we're headed. And I think you're right. Actually, what you what you mentioned earlier of people are asking the right questions. There are a lot of people that are having the right conversation right now. So I'm pretty hopeful that we will get there and that all of this is just policy is a long haul. It's not something that happens quickly. So we're in the process of making those changes happen. So I think that that's where we're heading. We're heading on the continued path towards the smart community. Mm. And I like, I mean, one of the biggest things about the smart community approach is that it forces us to have different conversations, particularly now that we're having more integrated conversations with, you know, a traditional public transport network, for example. But what it does is it allows us to question, yeah, we might choose the same technology that we have now, we might still pick the bus and maybe whatever the case is, maybe it's got a whatever, it's connected or it's whatever, or we're, you know, integrating payments or whatever. But it's actually forcing us to ask those questions and then seeking out those solutions that will benefit the community when we put that customer at the center. And I think that's what's really shifted. So you, when you put the customer at the center, you're forced to, well, one, engage with them, but two, ask those questions because if it's no longer about how do I deliver this, how does this service be delivered more effectively? And you go, how is the customer experience improved on this service? Then you have much better conversations overall. Yeah. And I just will add making sure that I'm having conversations of customers that don't look like me. So when you go and you have that dialogue, if you're only talking to people as if you're looking in a mirror, you're not actually designing for the people that are going to use the service most. So again, it, it's ensuring equity in all of the approach and then in the implementation and the outcome and the measurement after and the redesign if necessary, if it didn't actually meet the needs that you originally intended, constantly questioning and being willing to change is just inherent in the kind of work that we need to do right now. Are you looking for an engaging speaker, MC, or facilitator for your next big event? Then we've got you covered. Zoe is a go-to speaker, MC, and conversation facilitator with a difference. She's a master at simplifying the complex and making connections you might never see. Book Zoe for your next event. Email hello at mysmart.community or head over to her speaker page, www.mysmart.community forward slash speaking. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes, so thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.